Comparison can lead to one of two things. Comparison can either lead to pride or it can lead to insecurity. Have you ever, have you ever gotten caught in the comparison trap? Maybe on social media, <laughs> maybe it's happening this week, people are going on a trip that you're not going on. Maybe with your coworkers or maybe even teammates, classmates. I mean, it can happen with our, our homes and our cars and the way we dress. It's so easy to get caught in a comparison trap. Even for, for pastors, this happens, guys. Um, I've, I've been in rooms with, with other pastors, and they're like, so, so what is the square footage of you guys' auditorium? You know, it's like, or how many people have you guys baptized this year? And it's so easy for us to compare. Like I said, comparison will, will always lead to two things, one of two things. Comparison will either lead to us being proud, like we're better than somebody, or it'll lead to insecurity, where you feel bad about yourself. Comparison is a subtle trap that the enemy will use that seems so innocent. It seems so innocent, but it can really cause a lot of damage. And the enemy would love for us to focus on what other people have and not even notice the blessings that God has given us. It's so easy to get caught in the comparison trap, isn't it? And the problem is that when we start to compare, it kills contentment. Not only does comparison affect us personally, when we begin to compare ourselves with other people, it affects our relationships. And comparison can kill relationships. When we, when we see other people as, as competition, somebody to beat, someone versus someone to cheer on, we, we can really hurt each other. And, and competition can kill relationships. In chapters 1 through 11, since we started the book of Romans, we really took a deep dive into the theological explanation of the gospel. And um, for the next couple weeks, chapters 12 through 15, we're going to be looking, Paul's, Paul's going to be talking more about practical Christian living. And so specifically within the church, how do we interact with each other in a healthy way? And, and so for the next four weeks leading up to Easter, we're going to be uh, kind of doing this new, new message series just for a couple weeks, and we're just going to call it Church Killers. And so I'm going to be talking about four different things that we can do that will kill our church. And so number one church killer that we're going to look at today is compare and compete. The fastest way to kill this church is to begin to be competitive with each other and to compare our lives with each other. Today we're going to be, like I said, in Romans, we'll start with Romans 12, and we're going to just look at the first eight verses there today. There's a lot there, it's enough for a whole message, and so if you want to turn to your Bible or turn your attention to the screen, I'll read a couple verses, and then we'll study that, and then we'll, we'll read the rest. And so Romans 12, 1, it says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then listen to this. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, uh, what is good and what is acceptable and imperfect. And so right off the bat, Paul says, I appeal to you therefore. That word appeal uh, in, in Greek is parakaleo. And, and that just means strongly urged. So I just want you, as we start to, to talk through this, just know that Paul is like, oh, I strongly urge you right from the beginning. He, he is really kind of intense with what he's saying here. So because God is pouring his mercy out on all of us, we've talked about that for 11 chapters, because of this crazy mercy, this waterfall mercy that God is just pouring on all of us, the only response that makes any sense at all is for us to offer ourselves back to God. 
That's literally the only thing that makes any sense at all. So the best response to God's mercy is to offer him our lives. This is an act of worship to God. Living sacrifices, he talks about living sacrifices, and um, in this time, they sacrificed animals. Like a lot of the ancient tradition and the ancient um, churches included animal sacrifices, which sounds absolutely crazy to us, but this is um, even in Judaism. So Paul would have been really familiar with this. His writers would have been really familiar with animal sacrifices um, to, to cover sin. And, but Paul is saying, I know you guys know about that kind of sacrifice, but Paul's like, hey, God is calling us to be living sacrifices. And, and so, guys, the problem with living sacrifices, me and you, is we'll say, God, I give you my life, and then we crawl off the altar, right? Because we're afraid to actually live for God. And I, I just want to ask you this morning, at, at some point, have you ever really offered your whole life to God? And we talked about this, like I said, for 11 chapters, salvation, right? But it's more than salvation. Are, do you offer yourself to God daily? Like this is a daily thing. God, I give myself to you today. Take me, take, take me, all of me. Show me what you want me to do today. Lead me in my life today. Then Paul says this, don't be conformed, but be transformed. Don't be conformed, be transformed. What he's saying here is, don't be molded by the world that you live in. Don't, don't be molded by the world around you, be changed, be transformed by the God inside you. Don't be molded by the world around you, be transformed by the God inside you. And then, so how do we do that? How do we, how do, we do what Paul is saying? Well, he, he makes it really clear. First thing that he says is by renewing, the renewing of your mind. It takes a conscious effort on our part thinking about how God's way is different than the way that the world works around us, renewing your mind is allowing God to change the way we think. Bottom line. Renewing your mind is allowing God to change the way that we think. Can I just give you a couple examples of what this means to renew our minds? Number one is, and the best way, I think, is just to get into Scripture daily. Get into Scripture. That's going to change the way you think. When you start your day off with God and hearing the truth of God, that affects you the rest of the day. Number one, I would say, is to be in God's word. Remind yourself of God's truth. The second thing is, is I would say, is to worship God, which we just did, which was amazing. But can I tell you, this isn't the only place that I worship God. In fact, some of my most intimate times in worship, thank God I have tinted windows in my car, is driving. Like, I listen to worship music, a lot of the stuff that, that Adam and the band do here. And I'm telling you, I pulled up to stoplights just a puddle, right? Because it's just intimate time between me and God. I love worshiping with you guys, but man, there's something special when it's just you and God. And I would just encourage you, man, um, that affects your mind when you're with God by yourself and you're worshiping Him. It affects your relationship with God. It helps you renew your mind when you're in Scripture. Another thing is just to talk to God. Just talk to him through prayer. It changes the way you think when you spend time with God. Um, the last one I would say, and, and I've been affected by this this week, is surrounding yourself with some other encouraging believers. It will, it will point you to Jesus to be around other people that are following Jesus. It can help renew your mind. Those are just a couple things. But guys, once God begins to renew your minds, this affects what we do with our body. And, and so Paul says, this allows us to present our bodies and what we do with them as a, uh, as a act of worship to God. So it's not just what we think and what's going on on the inside, it's what we do with our bodies. This is, this is, inside out living right it's not what we do on the outside that affects us on the inside it's what we do on the inside first that affects the decisions that we make the way that we live what we do with our body 
And, and it's true, um, if, if you read Scripture, it tells us to take care of our bodies, that it's, it's the temple of God, of the Holy Spirit. It's a biblical principle to take care of anything that God has given you to be, to be a good steward. That's, that's really not what Paul's saying right here. What, what Paul's saying right here is that God wants all of us. He wants your thoughts. He wants your actions. He wants all of you. God wants fully devoted followers, not half-committed fans. God wants fully devoted followers. He ends verse 2, he says, and basically what he's saying is this is how we will know what God wants us to do. Once um, our lives are fully offered to God, our thoughts, our actions, everything, as an act of worship, as we pursue Him, we won't have a hard time figuring out God's will for our lives, what he wants us to do, how he wants us to live. When we've done this, it really won't be that hard to know what God wants us to do. I have never met a Christian, a true Christian, that didn't care what God wanted them to do with their life. I've never met a Christian that just didn't care. A true Christian. When I was 16 years old, I remember when I really, really uh, began to to live out live out my faith in a, in a real way. I really wanted to know what God wanted me to do with my life, and I started really asking those questions. And the more that I spent time with God in prayer, even being in the youth group that I was in, um, reading Scripture, all those things renewed my mind, affected my actions, and all of a sudden it was very obvious what God wanted me to do. You know why? Because I listened. And I spent some time with him, and he made it clear he wanted me to do what I'm doing right now. Something that that, um, he he says next is, verse 2, it says, by testing you may discern. Okay? And so this uh, phrase in Greek is dakamazeo, and and this phrase uh, means uh, work it out, like try it out. And so uh, something that I like to say a lot is action brings clarity right? Like, go for it. Like, go try it out. Go try it out. Two Christmases ago, Megan and the boys surprised me, like, big time with a new grill. I did not know that was happening. She hid it in one of our neighbor's garages, and, and Christmas, shows, Christmas comes, and they have this giant box. I'm like, what in the world? And didn't ask for it, just was really surprised. The grill that I was using was terrible. It's embarrassing. Every time I have people over, like, you know, half-cooked chicken and stuff, and I could, I just, like, one side worked pretty good, and it was pretty hot, and then the other side was pretty, um, you know, some of you guys have come over, you've been affected by this, you know, um, but, and then the other side was, like, chewy, like a gummy worm, and I just couldn't, and so you flip it back and forth, flip it back and forth, and so they, they gave me this new grill, we put it together, what's the first thing I did? I grabbed some hamburgers, threw them on them, and tried it out, right? It's just, that's what you're going to do with something like that. And what, what Paul is saying in the same ways to his reader, once you've fully surrendered your mind and your body to God, what are you going to do? You're not just going to sit there. He's like, go for it. Live out your faith. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? What are you waiting for? Guys, when we stop caring what other people think, we will begin to see what God wants for our lives. <clears throat> When we stop caring what other people think, we will begin to see what God wants for us. His ways are better. He has a plan and a purpose from your life, and it is better than anything that you could come up with. Can I share uh, a story of, uh, of my, in my own, from my own life of, of comparison? Um, one, of, one of our values here at our church is to share openly and honestly about our struggles, and so I'm about to do that, so give me some grace. I, I've been a pastor for 22 years. When I was 20 years old, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was 20 years old, I started working at a church while I was still in college even. And so I'm 42, so for, for however many years, 22 years I, I've been in, in ministry. Been youth ministry, led worship, and now pastor here at Open Door. And for, for 22 years, I've never been asked to speak at a camp or speak at a conference. It doesn't make any sense. I I watch my friends through social media. I see them at these camps in the summer. I'm like, what the heck? Why are they getting invited? We have this, like, we're like, I don't don't get it. What 
What did I do wrong? Is it my ADD? You know, is it, is it, am I just a little too hyper for people or is, am I just kind of weird? Like, what is it? Why can't, why am I not getting invited? And I'll just tell you, it's really brought up some insecurity in myself. Like, what is wrong with me? That did not, that insecurity did not come from God. And as I've had to surrender this stupid thing to God and my own insecurities, what I've realized is that I am right in the middle of what God wants me to do. I'm doing it. And I don't need to worry about what other people are doing. God, God has put me right here, right now. And I don't need to worry about what other people are doing. And I'm just telling you, it's one of those things that as I began to compare myself with my friends, I made it all about me. And really, at the end of the day, it's not about me and what I'm doing and that kind of stuff. It's, it's about God. And this, this is where He wants me. And I'm just telling you, when I finally surrendered that insecurity to God, that's when I realized... I don't need to worry about that. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Let's continue in verse 3. It says, For by grace, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. What is that right there? Thinking more highly than you ought to think. That's pride. That's pride. But to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body... We have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. um, It says, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, in service in our service, The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So what Paul is describing here in in verses 3 through 8 is how we are supposed to show each other, our church family, um, that our, our minds have been transformed and that our bodies have been given to Christ. You know how other people are going to know if we've done that? If we're humble and we serve each other. If we're humble and we serve each other, that means it's not about us. It's really hard to be prideful when you're serving other people. Um, and you'll notice too, being humble and serving each other is literally the opposite of comparing and competing. It's the opposite. The, the Greek word phroneo means your attitude. And what Paul is saying here is that your attitude towards each other, guys, this is talking to us, our attitudes towards each other here in our church need to be a posture or an attitude of humbleness. We're not looking down on anybody at all, but we're here to build each other up. And we really, we really believe that. Uh, verse 4, it says, one body with different members. Paul's using the analogy of the human body to show the unity that's needed and the diversity that should be there if we all come together in one body. It's a beautiful thing, man. Uh, it, it, the, body, the, the body of Christ works when we all bring what God has given us and, and we share that with each other. That's how we build each other up. So what has God given us? Well, he's given all of us a few things. He's given us uh, talents, so your natural talents. He's given you spiritual gifts, and he's given you resources. We all have this, guys, all of us. And so let me, let me break that down um, just a little bit. We're not meant to do, we're not meant to keep any of these to ourselves, by the way. God blesses us to be a blessing. God desires that we use all of these things to build each other up and so our natural talents well that's that's includes your personality that includes um, your character traits um, things that you're good at probably some things that your parents passed down to you the next thing is spiritual gifts Um, there's many administration evangelism uh, exhortation giving teaching uh, showing mercy prophecy shepherding and and serving there's many 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 spiritual gifts here and and scripture is very clear about those 
for, for me, I think my, my two big spiritual gifts, one is shepherding. I love to, to shepherd um, and, and love on people and be with people. And I, I do enjoy teaching too. And I feel like God has, has given me a gift in that. I'm thankful I get to use it. And God has given you a spiritual gift or a couple spiritual gifts. So you have that. Um, the next thing is, is resources, guys. God has given us all different resources. Uh, that is our money, that's our stuff, that's our connections even. And um, so like my house, it's not really my house. It's a place where God allows me to do ministry and invite people in. My, my car, it's not just my car. I can give people rides, right? God has given me what he's given me to share with other people. We're not supposed to hoard anything. As Christians, we should not have a shed where we keep all of our stuff and we hoard it. Everything that we have is meant to be shared. And um, Paul is saying, everything you have, use it. Use all of it for the glory of God and to build up the church. Then in verse 8, he kind of, and when it, when it says the church, we're not talking about this building, guys. It's each other, Right? Verse 8 says, if you're giving, give generously. If you're leading, do it diligently. If you're showing mercy, then do it cheerfully. Guys, we're blessed to be a blessing. We, everything that we have, um, God wants us to offer to others. Especially within the church, but that needs to go outside of the church as well. It's dangerous for us to compare our talents, our gifts, and our resources with other people. That's dangerous. We are not meant to compare what God has blessed us with. It's dangerous for us to compete with other Christians or with other churches even. Nothing makes me more angry than hearing pastors put down other churches. That's stupid. That's not our responsibility to worry about what other churches are doing. We're here to support other churches. I had lunch with a, a pastor from another church, from another denomination uh, last week, and it was the most encouraging thing ever. We talked about Jesus. I mean, seriously. We, we have things that we disagree on, but we had a lot we agreed on. We can agree on Jesus. We can agree on salvation. We can agree, agree on a lot, and so we did, and it was beautiful. Guys, we're on the same team. We're on the same team, um, so we should cheer each other on. Be happy for each other. Man, when you see someone succeeding or having like the best day of their life, does that make you jealous or, or can you be happy with them? Can you join them in celebration? I think God wants us to be thankful for our differences. Not be jealous of them. It takes all of us using everything that we have to be a healthy body. I, I, my desire is that this is a healthy church. And I, and I hope you have the same desire. And for us to do that, we need to build each other up. We need to use what God has given us to build each other up. Just like a healthy marriage, right? You have two different people, um, usually opposites attract. So you've got these two different people um, that have different gifts and abilities. And then a healthy marriage is where you're serving each other with those different gifts. Church is the same way. A healthy church has many different people with many different talents, gifts and resources, helping each other, walking with each other. When I think of, uh, of competition in comparison, what we're talking about today, and as I studied this in, in Romans, this passage, three, three different scriptures uh, came to my mind. I want to share those with you that, that relate to this, and this is how I'll close today. But uh, Proverbs 14.30, it says, A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh. But envy, which the root of envy is comparison, makes the bones rot. I, I literally think it can make us physically sick when we start envying people and comparing ourselves. And, and again, it's either going to make us prideful or insecure. Ne neither one of those options are good. We want peace instead of insecurity. We want peace instead of pride. Second one is James 3, 15 through 16. It says, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, from God. Listen to this. But earthly, unspiritual, demonic, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be what? Disorder in every vile practice. 
when we begin to compare, when we begin to envy what other people have and, and the ways that maybe God has blessed them, it can lead us down a very dark path. There's no contentment found in that path. We are not meant to compare our lives with other people. I want to read you uh, this last one, and it's Philippians 2, 3 through 8, and it says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, like Jesus, count others more significant than yourselves. That's that posture, that's that attitude that Paul was talking about. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Listen to what it says Jesus did. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and then it says, and being found in human form. What did Jesus do? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. That's very different than the culture that we live in, isn't it? Oh, I'm self-made, right? Or, I mean, it's all about us. We, we are kind of okay with people being proud. We're sort of like, me first is kind of like, oh yeah, self-care, take care of yourself, do whatever you need to do. Okay, but then you hear about Jesus. That's very different. Jesus put others first. It says that he emptied himself he became a servant and ultimately died on a cross for our sins and jesus is always always our example of how to live guys comparison and, and competition happen when we lose sight of god and when we lose sight of his plans for us and his plans for others You can't be focused on God and concerned about what somebody else is doing and comparing yourself to them. You gotta choose. Do you wanna just compare all the time and struggle with pride or insecurity? Or do you wanna keep your focus on God? That's what Paul's saying here today. Have you lost sight of God? Or are you struggling with comparison or, or competing with other people? Maybe, maybe you don't even notice that you're doing that. It's so easy to do, especially in our culture, like I said earlier with social media, it is so easy to compare ourselves with other people. Are you distracted from God? Are you self-focused? All these things can, can lead us away from God. And I wanna, I wanna say something to you this morning, and, and if you've been sleeping, and, and let me wake you up for a second. If you, if you don't hear anything else, can I tell you one thing this morning? And that is that you are unique, you are a unique, special creation of God. God made you just the way he made you, on purpose, with a purpose, and guess what? There's only one of you, and God did not mess that up. He doesn't make mistakes. So don't compare yourself to other people. There's no good that comes out of that, you know? Be, be thankful that you're different, that you're unique. Be cool with your earlobes, is what I'm trying to say. Be grateful for the diversity that we have in the body of Christ. It's a good thing that we're not all the same. We wouldn't get anything done. It's good that we're all different. We have different, like I said, talents. We have different personalities. We have different spiritual gifts. We have different resources. And God wants us to use all of it our backgrounds, our life experiences. God wants us to use everything that we have to build each other up. We can't do that if we're comparing ourselves with each other within the church. It's not healthy. We need to be able to cheer each other on and encourage each other, build each other up with everything that we have. Will you guys close your eyes. I want to lead us in a time of prayer and lead us into our time of response. God, it is so hard for us not to compare ourselves to other people. 
it is just so difficult in the world that we live in. God, we need your strength. We need your help. Help us to see what you are doing in our lives, the blessings that you've, you've given us, the grace that you've given us. God, just help us to be thankful. And God, where there's pride or insecurity, we just admit that to you. And we know that we just need to focus on you and be grateful for the way that you love us and the ways that you've provided for us. So God, during this time, we just want to surrender ourselves to you. We just want to worship you and talk to you. So we just give, give this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys